A Foundation field agent lays in the dirt, an iron spear sticking out of his chest. Not long after, a Foundation scientist screams and writhes on the ground, his face burnt by corrosive chemicals. Down in the depths of a dark, filthy cave tunnel, several mobile task force agents lay in a trap, pierced by homemade punji sticks, as deadly forces amass their numbers in a hidden place below. All of these members of Foundation personnel have been brought to their knees by an anomaly you'd never forget. The year is 2014, and researchers at the League for the Protection of Birds have started to notice a troubling trend in the area around Lake Grenouillot. The population of birds there appears to be sharply declining. Investigations into this phenomenon determine that this decline is due to a dramatic drop in the local insect, worm, and slug populations, which have previously served as the bird's food source. At this point, as the bird enthusiasts are left scratching their heads, the unusual ecological change attracts the attention of embedded SCP Foundation agents. Field agents Michel Duvarier and André Molin are promptly dispatched to the forest around the lake. The two agents, disguised as hunters to roam the area without attracting suspicion, take up temporary residence in a wooden cabin. The first three days pass without incident, and Agent Molin is becoming restless by the third night. He didn't expect his first field mission to involve quite so much birdwatching and taking lovely but boring nature walks. Meanwhile, Duvarier has made peace with the mission, content with the opportunity to take a break from the near-death experiences that so frequently plague her line of work. She's happy to kick back on the cabin's porch and delight in the sight of the occasional owl. As for the disappearing birds and insects, she'd just as soon believe it was climate change. Not everything is anomalous all the time, after all. As the two agents sit on the porch, they suddenly spot a few members of the League for the Protection of Birds and one of their vans. That in and of itself isn't that unusual, but they also spot something crawling toward the van, clutching an iron-tipped spear. Agent Molin can scarcely believe his eyes, but sure enough, there is a 1.5 meter tall frog person, dressed in a dark green uniform, brandishing a weapon. Uncertain of the situation and eager to evaluate it further before making a move, the two agents remain where they are, watching as the frog creature pokes at the empty van with its spear. It pries open the vehicle's hood, removes the oil container, and nervously retreats from the area. At this point, Agent Duvarier gives the order to follow the frog and determine where it is taking that stolen oil container. They track the frog, careful not to be spotted by the anxious amphibian until it reaches the shore of Lake Glenwio. Then it suddenly stops, inflates its vocal sac, and croaks long and loud. Two different voices croak in response, and two frogs emerge from the woods to meet it. Another emerges from the woods, a bit too close to the agents. It spots them and screams in terror, hopping away and running toward the water. The other frogs, startled and suddenly aware of the intrusion, dive into the water. Agent Molin, unwilling to give up the chase so soon, pursues the running frog. It looks at him with wide, fearful eyes, shrieking in shockingly fluent French for him to stay back. In an act of desperate self-defense, the frog throws its spear, piercing Agent Molin in the chest. As he collapses, Agent Duvarier moves quickly, drawing her hunting rifle and shooting a tranquilizer dart into the frog's neck. It falls to the ground, unconscious. Thanks to Agent Duvarier's quick intervention, Agent Molin is rushed into treatment and able to fully recover from his injuries. Meanwhile, the frog person is brought to the nearest testing site, where it is given the official designation SCP-5457. As soon as it regains consciousness, the frog begins to display hostile behavior. It attacks testing staff, showing an impressive grasp of various combat styles and strategies. Notably, its aggressive behavior seems to be entirely motivated by panic. The frog is utterly terrified of seemingly every human it encounters. In order to get to the bottom of the creature's behavior and hopefully understand its motivations, Dr. Béranger sits down for an interview with it. First, the frog is placed in high-security full-body restraints to prevent it from using the ability to coat its limbs in mucus and slip out of standard restraints, which it displayed several times when first brought into custody. Next, Dr. Béranger enters, escorted by two armed guards. The frog becomes immediately distressed, fixated on the sight of Dr. Béranger's white lab coat. It refers to him, with notable dread in its voice, as a chef. Perplexed, he corrects the amphibious prisoner, identifying himself as a department chief. First, Dr. Beranger asks the creature for its name. It introduces itself as Sergeant Martin Duval, 
and insists upon its commitment to its people, who it will not betray no matter how many knives are used on its slimy body. Dr. Berhanger scoffs at this and inquires about the frog's obsession with torture. He attempts to engage the frog politely, offering to make its cell more comfortable in exchange for cooperation. The frog goes silent, staring at the scientist with a look of solemn determination. It takes a deep breath. Assuming the frog is about to admit something sensitive, Dr. Berhanger encourages it to release whatever it's holding onto. And it does. It spews a massive amount of corrosive bile directly into Dr. Berhanger's face. The doctor lets out a scream of agony, falling to the ground. One guard rushes to his aid as the other tightens the frog's restraints. Though the frog is exhausted and overwhelmed by the ordeal, its lips purse into a satisfied smile as Dr. Berhanger is carried off to the medical ward. There, he's kept under observation for two days as his body is racked with high fevers and severe intestinal pains. Eventually, the symptoms subside, and he is discharged and cleared to return to work. In case of any future incidents, the medical staff develops an antitoxin that can be used to counter the effects of another similar attack. During Dr. Berhanger's time in the medical ward, staff attempted to conduct several follow-up interviews with Sergeant Duval, but it refused to answer any questions and attempted to attack anyone who got too close. Meanwhile, back in the area surrounding Lake Grand Guillot, agents have been spotting more and more of the frog people gathering resources from the forest. When the agents track these groups of frogs, they discover a massive cave system that appears to house an entire civilization of these intelligent frog people. They will later learn this is the République de Basse Grand Guillot, or the Republic of Under Frogia. A task force of 25 agents is sent to explore the caves and gather as much additional information as possible. None of the agents could have ever predicted the strength of the Republic's military forces or the frog's preparedness for a potential invasion. When the agents first descend into the caves, they accidentally trigger a trap which launches iron-tipped spears from concealed compartments in the cave walls. Five agents are wounded by these spears and are forced to return to the surface to receive medical treatment. Another trap is triggered soon after, but the remaining agents are ready for it this time. They dodge its spears and manage to make it through an additional trap that drops buckets of toxic bile from above, relatively unscathed as well. Feeling optimistic, they continue to advance through the cave system. After three hours of exploring, they reach the heavily fortified ramparts of the Republic. The frog soldiers fire on sight, using a combination of artillery and siege weapons to force the agents into retreat. During the process, seven agents are killed and 13 are injured. As tensions between the Foundation and the Republic grow, with no peaceful resolution in sight, Agent Molin requests the chance to speak with Sergeant Duval. He and Agent Duvalier are granted permission to do so and are permitted to enter the observation room adjacent to the sergeant's cell. The frog is shocked by the sight of Agent Molin, whom it believes it has killed. Much to Molin's shock, the frog believes that he has come here to eat it in an act of revenge for it nearly killing him. Agent Duvalier presses this matter, demanding to know why the frog is so convinced that it will be eaten. Is it because you're a frog and we're French? Is that really all there is to it? The frog admits that it is as simple as that. We've seen what you do to those like us. We know what you've done to us. Why do you think we hide from you? Agent Duvalier is shocked. She doesn't really enjoy frogs' legs at all and doesn't consider them to be an especially popular ingredient. As for Agent Molin, he's a vegetarian. They attempt to steer Sergeant Duval toward the subject of his homeland, which they have now discovered. He is horrified by this news, assuming that his people are doomed to a gruesome, butter-basted fate. Duvalier and Molin attempt to convince the frog to cooperate to get the rest of the Republic to cooperate. The Foundation can't leave the Republic alone now that it knows a frog army is living beneath France. Either peace must be established, or the potential threat must be neutralized. The two agents offer Martin a deal. If it wants to help its people, it can cooperate with the Foundation and help them make non-violent contact with Underfrogia. Martin is not a frog who takes such things lightly and spends the next four days deliberating over the Foundation's offer. It asks to speak with Agents Molin and Duvalier, inquiring about the nature of the Foundation as an organization, about its intentions toward the people of Underfragia, and, without fail, whether or not either agent is secretly planning to eat it. Eventually, it announces a willingness to cooperate. Agent Molin, Agent Duvalier, and Sergeant Martin Duval all sit down at a table together to confer. 
First and foremost, Martin warns that the frogs will not negotiate with anyone who is French, they will not trust them, and any reasonable underfrogian would sooner eat their own skin than listen to a French person. As a brief cultural note, it is considered a social taboo to eat one's own shed skin in underfrogian society. In terms of winning the trust of the amphibians, the foundation can do so with food. Martin explains that the crops and cattle of underfrogia were decimated by an epidemic and the people are starving. This is the reason for the sudden appearance of frogs on the surface, scavenging for food and other resources. This very same scavenging caused the drop in local wildlife populations, attracting the Foundation's attention in the first place. So if the Foundation wishes to make a good impression on underfrogia, it should offer its support in the form of food-based aid. Martin agonizes over its decision to open up to the Foundation officers, worried it may not have done the right thing. Agent Duvarier attempts to assuage these fears, promising that the Foundation doesn't go out of its way to kill anomalies, and that the containment staff will likely be able to help the Underfrogians remain hidden, keeping their home safe and sound. Martin, however, will not be permitted to return to them, at least for the time being, as it is a valuable negotiation asset, as well as an intriguing test subject. Martin accepts this, willing to do its duty to protect the rest of the frogs. After this conversation with Martin, the Foundation develops a new strategy. Foundation agents from the United Kingdom travel to the front lines of Underfrogia, where they stage a fake attack on the French Foundation agents there. To the citizens of Underfrogia, this new group of notably non-French humans appears to drive the French forces away from their gates. At this point, these new UK agents offer food supplies to the Underfrogians, the specific contents of which were chosen based on suggestions from Martin. At this point, with enough goodwill established between the Foundation and Underfrogia, a peace treaty was able to be signed, establishing the nature of their containment. The current special containment procedures for SCP-5457 are as follows. Because it is not feasible to contain all instances of SCP-5457, instances of the species are considered to be contained on-site in their home under Lake Lenuyo. The Foundation is responsible for regulating tourism and research in the area in order to prevent any civilians from discovering the Republic of Underfrogia. Food, materials for the manufacture of common goods, and other necessary supplies are to be regularly delivered to Underfrogia by the Foundation. This will prevent the frogs from needing to conduct any expeditions to the surface, allowing them to remain hidden. In addition to these material resources, security consultants and other necessary aid will be given to SCP-5457 in order to aid them in their quest to conceal their existence from humanity at large. No French personnel are permitted to interact with SCP-5457, and during these interactions, personnel are instructed to make frequent references to the popularity of frogs in French cuisine. The more afraid the frogs are of the French, the less likely they are to attempt to escape containment. A healthy fear of the French and their supposed desire to eat frogs helps keep Underfrogia hidden. If the Foundation must artificially stoke the flames of that fear, then so be it. Following the signing of the peace treaties, an exchange program is established between the SCP Foundation and the Republic of Underfrogia under the leadership of Dr. Graham. Shortly after its establishment, the program reported massively successful results. One of the most notable discoveries resulting from the exchange is the abundance of advanced chemistry and genetics research conducted by the Underfrogian scientists. In exchange for this knowledge, the Foundation teaches the frog scientists about steam-powered technology, which they plan to implement in their society particularly where it applies to defense and concealment strategies. Throughout the exchange program, Foundation staff also do their best to keep the underfrogian fear of the French alive and well. Misinformation is propagated, such as the claim that the French enjoy boiling frogs alive to remove the grease and slime from their bodies. During the exchange, Foundation diplomat Cameron discovers that Terrare is a significant cultural figure in underfrogia and the object of a great deal of fear. She accompanies Assemblyman Trunion, an underfrogian politician, to a production of a play about the terrors of Terrare. After the production, she takes the opportunity to bond with Trunion over the fear of being devoured by a Frenchman. She shows the Assemblyman some carefully curated and edited footage of SCP-082 Fernand the Cannibal as he devours all manner of meat, human and otherwise. The Assemblyman is sick to his stomach at the sight, and the very next day, introduces a bill to increase the Underfrogian military budget, specifically with regard to the development of heavy siege weapons. 
As the Foundation's relationship with the frogs improves, some older frogs reach out with concerns about the impact the human frog piece is having on the youth. The young frogs and tadpoles are no longer as afraid of humans and seem to be confident they could safely venture to the surface. To nip this in the bud, Dr. Graham performs a series of lectures at Underfrogian schools, teaching the children about the evils of the French. He shows them footage of frog dissections performed in human science classes for good measure, scaring any surface-dwelling aspirations right out of them. Years pass, and the Republic of Underfrogia begins to resent the continued containment of Sergeant Martin Duval. They demand its return on the basis that it is no longer needed as a hostage in light of the stable diplomatic situation. The Foundation agrees, and Martin is returned to its beloved home in the Republic. As Martin readjusts to life in Underfrogia, it sends letters to agents Molin and Duvarier. But that isn't the only way it's passing its time. In secret, Martin has been organizing a rebel movement of frogs, convincing them that the Foundation is lying and that they can live safely on the surface. The number of frogs involved in this movement steadily climbed, reaching 370 by 2017. At this point, Martin cannot wait any longer. They attempt to break out of containment once and for all. Soldiers and scavengers alike exit the perimeter without much trouble. Foundation security personnel attempt to stop them, but only capture 12 frogs. The rest of them scatter, vanishing into the forest. The only thing the Foundation can think to do is dispatch a response force, sending Foundation agents into the forest to recapture the frogs. One of the agents assigned to this task is none other than Agent Duvarier. She tracks Martin to a forest guard outpost, where he is hiding with 22 other frogs. When she enters the room, all of the frogs dart toward the back wall, pressing themselves against it in fear. Martin encourages them to calm down and greets his old ally, Michel. She responds in kind, Martin. It inquires about André and his whereabouts, and Duvarier responds that he's left for a position with the mole rats, and she hopes she won't have bad news for him when she sees him next. She pleads with Martin, asking it to return to Underfrogia. The other frogs will certainly follow. Martin refuses. Home, you mean this damp and dark hole? Normal, you mean living under a lie that suffocated us for generations? We were stuck down there, stagnating in the caves, and it was all for nothing. That's what I told them, showed them that we could live on the surface. It's amazing here. We can feel the sun on our faces, the wind on our pores, drink fresh and natural water. So, no, Michel. At this point, Martin croaks loudly, signaling all nearby frogs. Agent Duvarier steps outside to find frogs exiting the woods, surrounding her location. Martin steps outside after her, moving to block her path. She draws her weapon, aiming it at the frog she had begun to consider a friend. You can't hide here. People will find you. They'll freak out. Sure, Martin responds. But it's not like they'll eat us. She pleads with Martin, begging the frog to retreat, to not force her to do something they will both regret. Martin refuses. A frog soldier has its duty, and this is Martin's duty for the people of Underfrogia. Martin promises that it will never back down. Agent Duvarier turns, surveying her surroundings. There are hundreds of frogs watching, waiting to see what happens next. Martin continues. In time, all of us will conquer our fears, and we will become examples for the rest of the people of Underfrogia. We'll show them that there's no reason to fear the Frenchman, just like I am showing them that I do not fear you. My people will live free from terror. Agent Duvarier takes a deep, long breath. Tears sting her eyes as she prepares to do something she once promised she would never do. She steadies her aim. She opens her mouth. She tries not to think about what her duty now requires. Days later, Agent Duvarier writes a formal request to cite Director Verne. It reads as follows. Director Verne, I understand that I need my full memories for the Essex Committee hearing tomorrow. After all, I have to be able to provide a full account of what happened. But whatever the verdict may be, I am formally requesting to go under amnestic treatment after the conclusion of the hearing. I won't need those memories anymore. And I really want to forget the taste. Sincerely, Agent Michel Duvarier. Duty can be the force that propels us, that helps us fight for the greater good. But it can also drive us to do truly terrible things.
You know, I've never had very much interest in trying frog's legs. Now, after looking into the details of SCP-5457 and the horrors they faced, I can say that my small amount of interest has been reduced to zero. It's best to leave things be, I find. As they say, let sleeping dogs lie. And let sentient frogs with an intricate societal structure and an understanding as well as fear of their own mortality, well, live. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-165, The Creeping Hungry Sands of Tool.